science up a blind alley. In regard to both questions alike, there is a limitation which is often ignored, both in popular thought and in philosophy. Neither question can be asked intelligibly about reality as a whole, including God, but only about parts of it. As regards the teleological explanation, it usually arrives before long at a creator, or at least an artificer, whose purposes are realized in the course of nature. But if a man is so obstinately teleological as to continue to ask what purpose is served by the Creator, it becomes obvious that his question is impious. It is, moreover, unmeaning, since to make it significant we should have to suppose the Creator created by some super-creator whose purposes he served. The conception of purpose, therefore, is only applicable within reality, not to reality as a whole. A not dissimilar argument applies to mechanistic explanations. One event is caused by another, the other by a third, and so on. But if we ask for a cause of the whole, we are driven again to the Creator, who must himself be uncaused. All causal explanations, therefore, must have an arbitrary beginning. That is why it is no defect in the theory of the atomists to have left the original movements of the atoms unaccounted for. It must not be supposed that their reasons for their theories were wholly empirical. The atomic theory was revived in modern times to explain the facts of chemistry, but these facts were not known to the Greeks. There was no very sharp distinction in ancient times between empirical observation and logical argument. Parmenides, it is true, treated observed facts with contempt, but Empedocles and Anaxagoras would combine much of their metaphysics with observations on water clocks and whirling buckets. Until the sophists, no philosopher seems to have doubted that a complete metaphysic and cosmology could be established by a combination of much reasoning and some observation. By good luck, the atomists hit on a hypothesis for which, more than two thousand years later, some evidence was found, but their belief in their day was nonetheless destitute of any solid foundation. Like the other philosophers of his time, Leucippus was concerned to find a way of reconciling the arguments of Parmenides with the obvious fact of motion and change. As Aristotle says, Although these opinions, those of Parmenides, appear to follow logically in a dialectical discussion, yet to believe them seems next door to madness when one considers the facts. For indeed, no lunatic seems to be so far out of his senses as to suppose that fire and ice are one. It is only between what is right and what seems right from habit that some people are mad enough to see no difference. Leucippus, however, thought he had a theory which harmonized with sense perception and would not abolish either coming to be and passing away or motion and the multiplicity of things. He made these concessions to the facts of perception. On the other hand, he conceded to the monists that there could be no motion without a void. The result is a theory which he states as follows. The void is a not-being, and no part of what is is a not-being. For what is, in the strict sense of the term, is an absolute plenum. This plenum, however, is not one. On the contrary, it is a many, infinite in number and invisible owing to the minuteness of their bulk. The many move in the void, for there is a void and by coming together they produce coming to be, while by separating they produce passing away. Moreover, they act and suffer action whenever they chance to be in contact, for they are not one, and they generate by being put together and becoming intertwined. From the genuinely one, on the other hand, there could never have come to be a multiplicity, nor from the genuinely many a one. That is impossible. It will be seen that there was one point on which everybody so far was agreed, namely, that there could be no motion in a plenum. In this, all alike were mistaken. There can be cyclic motion in a plenum, provided it has always existed. The idea was that a thing could only move into an empty place, and that in a plenum there are no empty places. It might be contended, perhaps validly, that motion could never begin in a plenum, but it cannot be validly maintained that it could not occur at all. To the Greeks, however, it seemed that one must either acquiesce in the unchanging world of Parmenides or admit the void. 
Now, the arguments of Parmenides against not being seemed logically irrefutable against the void, and they were reinforced by the discovery that where there seems to be nothing, there is air. This is an example of the confused mixture of logic and observation that was common. We may put the Parmenidean position in this way. You say there is the void, therefore the void is not nothing. Therefore, it is not the void. It cannot be said that the atomists answered this argument. They merely proclaimed that they proposed to ignore it, on the ground that motion is a fact of experience, and therefore there must be a void, however difficult it may be to conceive. Footnote. Bailey maintains, on the contrary, that Leucippus had an answer which was extremely subtle. It consisted essentially in admitting the existence of something, the void, which was not corporeal. Similarly, Burnett says, It is a curious fact that the atomists, who are commonly regarded as the great materialists of antiquity, were actually the first to say distinctly that a thing might be real without being a body. End of footnote. Let us consider the subsequent history of this problem. The first and most obvious way of avoiding the logical difficulty is to distinguish between matter and space. According to this view, space is not nothing, but is of the nature of a receptacle, which may or may not have any given part filled with matter. Aristotle says, Physics 208b, The theory that the void exists involves the existence of place for one would define void as place bereft of body. This view is set forth with the utmost explicitness by Newton, who asserts the existence of absolute space and accordingly distinguishes absolute from relative motion. In the Copernican controversy, both sides, however little they may have realized it, were committed to this view since they thought there was a difference between saying the heavens revolve from east to west and saying the earth rotates from west to east. If all motion is relative, these two statements are merely different ways of saying the same thing, like John is the father of James, and James is the son of John. But if all motion is relative, and space is not substantial, we are left with the Parmenidean arguments against the void on our hands. Descartes, whose arguments are of just the same sort as those of early Greek philosophers, said that extension is the essence of matter, and therefore there is matter everywhere. For him, extension is an adjective, not a substantive. Its substantive is matter, and without its substantive it cannot exist. Empty space to him is as absurd as happiness without a sentient being who is happy. Leibniz, on somewhat different grounds, also believed in the plenum, but he maintained that space is merely a system of relations. 